I'd like to talk a little bit about that other Hawthorne novel that never manages uh, to get read by anyone these days, not very often at least. Um, this is The House of Seven Gables, The House of the Seven Gables, uh, also by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I was I mentioned in the last video in my review of uh, Bl the Blythedale Romance that I had this vague memory of reading the Scarlet Letter in middle school. I think it might have been and coming away feeling like you would expect after you'd read a novel um, about Puritan repression, um, though that's really all I was able to make of it at the time. The House of the Seven Gables was like finding a Hawthorne. I never knew before. One of ghosts, uh, the eternal return of historical memory, and this sort of high gothic romance. This time it reminded me more of Horace Walpole, um, The Castle of Otranto, and uh, Matthew Lewis's novel The Monk, uh, than it did the cold puritanism that I once associated with Hester Prynne. So in this sense, it stood up to what Hawthorne identified most of his longer fiction as, that is, as romance. Um, in the late 17th century, the eponymous house, uh, the, the House of the Seven Gables, actually inspired by a historical um, 1688 colonial mansion in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, served as the residence of a Colonel Pynchon, who once uh, accused a man named Matthew Mall of sorcery in order to have him hanged, and then stole the land upon which he would eventually build his house. One day, the Colonel keels over at his desk under pretty mysterious circumstances, but his presence and his nefariousness seem to haunt the Pynchon house in various ways even after his death. Several generations later, uh, a woman by the name of Hepzibah and her intellectually challenged brother, Clifford, uh, come to occupy this house. They're both descendants of the colonel, uh, but now the family fortune and their good reputation have sort of withered away so much that Hepzibah has, uh, has to open a store in her house to make some extra money, and she thinks of herself... Uh, is sort of an abject failure because of it. Uh, Holgrave, who is a daguerreotypist, uh, rents a room from Hepzibah upstairs, and one day a distant relation of both Clifford and Hepzibah named Phoebe Pynchon visits and manages to quickly change the whole tenor of the house. She's able to bring sort of vim and vigor to Hepzibah's failing penny shop and she gives Clifford the companionship and attention that he really needs and deserves. Uh, just as soon as she appears, however, she, she leaves again, and the house falls into its former dilapidated, really depressed state. Judge Pynchon, uh, another member of the family and a wealthy man about town with a pretty imminent reputation, appears at Hepzibah's house and announces that he wants to institutionalize Clifford. The judge claims that Clifford knows the whereabouts of certain documents that will allow him to access the vast tracts of land in Maine that he wants to get a hold of. While waiting to talk to Clifford, the judge dies in much the same way that the colonel did so many generations before. Uh, Hepzibah and Clifford, Clifford uh, head to a train station uh, to leave their pretty weird circumstances. Uh, and later Phoebe returns to the house with only the artist Holgrave in residence and admits how he has maybe somewhat predictably, uh, always loved her. So Hepzibah and, and Clifford soon return to live there with Phoebe having inherited all the judges ill gotten. Holgrave pro proclaims that he is himself a distant relative of Matthew Mall, uh, so long ago the, the young man accused of conjury. Uh, the House of Seven Gables, so long riven by tumult and strife, is finally exercised by that ultimate mage, 
love. So I read this mostly as a meditation on the transgressions of history and our inevitable tendency to bear them witness no matter how far removed in time we are from them. Uh, two of Hawthorne's really pet concerns and major preoccupations in his novels. Uh, it's pretty interesting how the sins of Colonel Pynchon seem almost to take place in a prelapsarian past, while at the same time having such a profound effect on the characters that are dealing, that are being dealt with in the novel, in the novel that is the present day. Um, uh, the figures of the Salem witch trials, one of whom was actually Judge John uh, Hathorne, that's Hawthorne without the W, um, who was Nathaniel's great-great-grandfather, who found many witches guilty during the Salem witch trials. Um, these people sort of haunt the novel in spirit, but so do all kinds of then modern technologies from Holgrave's daguerreotype uh, to the train that Hepzibah and Clifford used to escape the ghosts of their past. It's just a an interesting um, book. It was first published in uh, 1851, and with the possibility of freedom from the freedom from the past being really central to the novel and what it's trying to accomplish. Hawthorne might have meant for this to be, at least in some respects, a commentary on the... Uh, it was, of course, still almost a, a decade away, but the looming Civil War. Um, as Faulkner, another uh, equally concerned... Uh, another writer equally concerned with the onus of history and the weight that it bears down on us, said in his... In his famous quote, of course, the, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And that, I mean, this is, this is the novel that says that. This one. N not Faulkner. Uh, Faulkner says that too, but this is the 19th century American novel that says that. So I really enjoyed this. Um, I uh, enjoyed it quite a bit more than the Blythedale romance. And um, just really gothic, a lot of interesting things to think about, a lot of creepy, weird people, um, just just a really, really fun read. If, if you've read um, The Scarlet Letter and you think that's all there is, well, that and his short stories maybe, pick this up. It's, it's a fun book. Nathaniel Hawthorne's The House of the Seven Gables.